Hello everyone, you're watching Physio Classroom channel and in today's video, I am going to share with you all some very interesting and important information based on which you can easily diagnose the level of lesion in sudden onset stroke patient without even having a CT scan or MRI. So let's get started. Now to clearly understand the various steps involved in the diagnosis making for the level of lesion in sudden onset stroke, I have drawn here diagram of a pyramidal tract. Now pyramidal tract comprises of the corticospinal tract originating from the cortex, descending down through the brainstem and then crossing to the other side via the lower inferior portion of the medulla. The corticobulbar tract which is again the second important tract of the pyramidal system again originates from the cortex and then it descends down and terminates in the brainstem to the respective cranial nerve nuclei. Now as you can see here in this diagram I have drawn three important cranial nerve nuclei which will be taken into consideration while diagnosis making. These are the third cranial nerve nuclei present in the midbrain, the seventh cranial nerve nuclei present in the pons and the twelfth cranial nerve nuclei present in the medulla. So whenever we have a patient of sudden onset hemiplegia, the first step to determine the level of lesion is to assess for the seventh cranial nerve that is the facial nerve. So in your patient you have to first check for any facial deviation, facial asymmetry, presence of loss of facial movements. So there are three expected findings which can be seen on examining the seventh cranial nerve which are number one that the facial nerve is affected on the same side of hemiplegia which means let's say for example we have a patient of left hemiplegia and the facial nerve involvement is also on the left side so the facial nerve involvement is on the same side of the hemiplegia second observation that can be seen is that the facial nerve involvement is contralateral to the side of hemiplegia and this is very interesting the patient is having left hemiplegia but facial nerve involvement is on the right side. Now these all findings have value in determining the level of lesion. The third finding that we may get is that the facial nerve is normal. There is no abnormality in the facial nerve. So let's first consider the finding when we get the facial nerve involvement contralateral to the side of hemiplegia. Let's say for example, we have a patient of left hemiplegia but on examination we find out that the right facial nerve is involved. So we have this presentation of contralateral involvement of the facial nerve with respect to the side of hemiplegia. So whenever this is the case, you can diagnose with confirmation that the site of lesion is pons. Now why is it so? Because now again you have to pay attention to this diagram of the pons in which you see whenever there will be any infarction or hemorrhage right here in the right half of the pons it is going to damage two important structures which are the corticospinal tract. Now because of the damage to the right side corticospinal tract because it is going to cross on the left side so the person is going to have hemiplegia on the left side. Now have a look at this facial nerve nuclei. The right sided facial nerve nuclei is also going to get damaged. And we all know that whenever there is a lesion in the nuclei or the nerve it is a element type of lesion and the facial nerve controls the same side of the face. So whenever there will be damage to the right sided facial nerve nuclei this person is going to have paralysis of the right half of the face. So lesion in the right half of the face due to involvement of the 7th cranial nerve nuclei on the right side of the pons and left hemiplegia again due to involvement of the corticospinal tract on the right side of the pons will be a typical presentation only when there is a lesion in the pons. So if you have this finding you do not need to progress further and you can terminate your assessment there and conclude that the patient is having lesion in the pons. Now let's take up the second finding which we can get which is that the facial nerve is involved on the same side of hemiplegia. 
that is the person is having left hemiplegia and the facial nerve involvement is also on the left side so that means for the left facial nerve to get involved this side facial nerve which is the left side facial nerve should be affected now as you can see here i have drawn the corticobulbar tract also which is innervating the upper and the lower half of the seventh cranial nerve nuclei now as we all know that the upper half of the seventh cranial nerve nuclei has bilateral innervation from both the cortex so that means for the upper half to get involved both sided corticobulbar tracts should be involved but in this situation in stroke we have involvement on one side so whenever there will be involvement of the right sided corticobulbar tract because it is innervating the lower half of the seventh cranial nerve nuclei this person is going to get left sided hemiplegia with left sided upper motor neuron type of palsy that means he is going to have involvement only of the contralateral lower half the upper half is going to be spared because of bilateral innervation from both side of the cortex so for now just remember that whenever the facial nerve involvement will be contralateral to hemiplegia the site of lesion will be in pons whenever the facial nerve involvement is on the same side of hemiplegia the site of lesion is above pons which we have to determine further so now let's progress to this third finding which we may also get during our examination now the third finding is that we may get facial nerve normal that is there is no involvement of the facial nerve now this finding will be considered in the end of the lecture so that there is minimal confusion so now we have facial nerve involvement on the same side of hemiplegia so now we have to check whether the lesion is in the midbrain or not so for this our second step would be to determine or to evaluate the third cranial nerve nuclei which is the oculomotor nerve now as we all know that the oculomotor nerve supplies the muscles of the eyeball so you have to look for or examine the oculomotor nerve to determine whether the lesion is in the midbrain or not so if in our patient we get this presentation that the patient is having left sided hemiplegia and the third nerve involvement is being seen on the right side that is contralateral to the side of hemiplegia then again we can conclude that the site of lesion is in the midbrain because any infarction or hemorrhage on the right side of the midbrain is going to damage the right corticospinal tract again going to produce left hemiplegia and it is going to damage the right third nerve nuclei which is going to produce the signs and symptoms of third nerve damage on the right side so now we have already described how to diagnose two important sites of stroke which are the pons and the midbrain so whenever in our patient we have seventh cranial nerve involvement contralateral to the side of hemiplegia we can diagnose the site as pons and usually the syndrome that we see is known as the millard gabler syndrome in which there is ipsilateral involvement of the seventh cranial nerve nuclei and contralateral hemiplegia similarly if we see in our patient that the patient is having ipsilateral third nerve palsy with contralateral hemiplegia then we can diagnose the site as midbrain and the syndrome is known as the weber syndrome now let's progress further in our diagnosis making so now we have a patient who has seventh nerve palsy ipsilateral to hemiplegia and there is no third nerve palsy so in such a situation the site of lesion is even above the midbrain so the three important sites which are left to diagnose are the internal capsule the corona radiata and the cortex now whenever the lesion will be in the internal capsule because all the fibers are condensing and passing through this narrow passage even a minor stroke or a small lesion can produce massive damage so to diagnose the site of lesion as internal capsule we must have in our patient dense hemiplegia now what is dense hemiplegia dense hemiplegia refers to massive weakness or loss of power in both the upper limb and the lower limb both the upper limb and lower limb are equally affected and the power is almost zero 
So whenever we have this picture, then we can diagnose the site as internal capsule. But if we do not find dense hemiplegia and instead we are getting monoparesis or monoplegia, then we can diagnose the site as corona radiata. Now remember, all these exons which are coming out from the pyramidal cells of the cortex, they are fan shaped. That means we have the fibers originating from the face, the trunk, the upper limb, the lower limb and any damage in the corona radiata is not going to produce massive paralysis because a lesion here is going to damage only the lower limb fibers, a lesion here is going to damage only the upper limb fibers. So we will get paralysis more in the upper limb or the lower limb and so we can diagnose the lesion as in corona radiata. Now what if the lesion is in the cortex? So if there is a cortical lesion then we will get the cortical signs. So if in our patient we see that the patient is having aphasia or the patient is having hemi neglect or hemi amopia or seizures then such findings correspond to the site of lesion as being in the cortex. So this is how we can diagnose whether the lesion is in the pons or the midbrain or the internal capsule or the corona radiata or the cortex. Now in certain stroke patients in our examination finding we may see that the seventh cranial nerve is normal and this is what we left in our lecture before. So whenever we get the seventh cranial nerve as normal then there could be two possibilities. The first possibility is that that particular person is a case of recovering stroke and the impact of the stroke on the involvement of the facial nerve has been withdrawn. The second possibility is that the site of lesion is below the pons because there is one condition which is known as the medial medullary syndrome in which there is involvement of the medial half of one side of the medulla. In such a situation, the two important structures that are going to damage are the right corticospinal tract again producing left hemiplegia and the right 12th cranial nerve palsy that is involvement of the hypoglossal nerve of the right side. So whenever we get this picture in which we have right sided hypoglossal nerve involvement and left sided hemiplegia then also we can determine that the site of lesion is in medulla and the syndrome is known as the medial medullary syndrome. This is one of my favorite lecture that I usually take for my postgraduate student. Do try and utilize this knowledge in determining the site of lesion in sudden onset stroke patient. See you in our next video. Till then keep learning, keep sharing and stay connected.